Go ahead. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Joseph Polly. I'm the uh, CEO of ZCubes Inc. Uh, we are Houston-based, uh, Texas-based, um, and uh, we work on a you know domain called uh, omnifunctional AI. Um, and uh, we have been developing the software over the last you know decade or so. And uh, uh, you know, with the merging of AI into everything, it's been a very exciting time. And I wanted to kind of uh, you know when um, Al asked me to uh, talk about AI, um, I thought I'll give you kind of an introduction into uh, you know the several aspects of AI, the, the kind of history, the recent history of it, and how it's going and. Uh, we're expecting to achieve something called singularity in about 2045 and uh, you know how it's all merging into that and you know what are some of the terms that you can you can think about and i've intentionally tried to keep you know some content some extra content in the slides which is grayed out it's it's meant for when you go through the slides yourself uh, you know after the presentation it will give you more information so it's not entirely minimalistic in a way uh, but um, so we we have been working with omnifunctionality and ai for Quite some time, and uh, you know, we realized that we have achieved certain kind of you know merging of all of these into into a single space. And I'll show you some of the snapshots as we go along. Um, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, so, uh, and I, I'm going to do some you know, metaphysical stuff in, in a way. Um, so, the uh, you know, I would say the the creation, you know, the very first thing that happened is the creation of the first bit, you know, before that there was nothing and then there was something and that something is where, you know, the entire universe starts. So uh, I would say the very first act of, act of creation was the formation of the first bit. And, you know, bits evolve and, you know, we can see bits in as data, we can see it as information, it evolves into knowledge and eventually to wisdom. But one of the things that, you know, if you look deep enough into the world around you, you realize that, start realizing that the universe is not continuous, uh, you know, analog, it's actually digital. And uh, it's important to notice that. And why do I say that? For example, all the matter you see in the world, you know, you look at the periodic table of elements, every element has a certain atomic number and they are one, two, three, like that. If it's two, it's helium, it's three, it's lithium and so forth. Electron shells have certain states and, you know, th there is no state in between that, you know. So it's almost like digital, even physical world is digital. You look at biological world, DNA, RNA, composed of A, T, C, G, and U, the code that repeats all over, you know, it's, you know, um, so even in biology, it is kind of digital. Likewise, you take alphabets that we speak with or we communicate with, um, and uh, what you notice is that, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, like it's, it's almost digital. There is no letter between A and B. Right, so digital is an important nature of uh, of the universe, of all of information. And in the, uh, the ancients used to say things like, you know, word was God, word was with God, word that is God, and stuff like that. Which, you know, if you really look at it, you know, information is the universe. You know, and um, um, so, um, you know, we might think, you know, what about perception? Something like, you know, how you see things, right? Um, even in perception, there is digital nature to it. For example, if you have, if you're holding a bag of chips in your hand, and if you add an additional chip to it, um, you wouldn't feel it unless that exceeds a certain threshold. Likewise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to discern two notes of music, you know, unless they are different by a certain amount. And that threshold is kind of what, um, you know, that's kind of fixed by um, by nature. So even our senses are kind of digital. So. Um, in a way that, you know, so from bits to information, but where does intelligence come in? Where does consciousness come in? You know, and this is something that came to me when I was actually in a Mexican restaurant having dinner. Um, I kind of realized that, you know, we could potentially look at intelligence as information animating itself. And if inf intelligence um, can then animate itself, and that could potentially be what consciousness is. And uh, that's a very interesting insight for me, which basically says from bits, you can go all the way to intelligence and uh, you know, eventually to consciousness, and which probably is what people call as God and whatever. Um, and this is where we come to what artificial intelligence is, right? And artificial intelligence is formation of information, which is animating itself and stuff. And if you look at the internals of chat GPT and stuff, you'll see that it is all metrics, manipulations on information, statistics, probability, and things like that working together. So what I'll be doing in the rest of the presentation is to actually show you 
you know, what are the different things that happen? When did it happen? Who, what, why, and how this thing is going to evolve from what we had in the 1950s to, you know, where we are going to the singularity in the 2050s. So the first thing to, you know, understand about AI, it's that it's a paradigm shift. Now, so far we are used to, you know, for example, the old paradigm where we write a program to take input and create output. That's the old model. With AI, that has changed. It's a new paradigm in which input and output actually creates the program. And that's a big paradigm shift. And all of these, this, this play with information started with Claude Shannon, and he wrote a, a beautiful master's thesis. This is considered to be the best master's thesis ever written in about 1937, um, and uh, in which he recognized that you could take electrical circuits and stuff and represent Boolean logic inside of it. And um, so he is considered to be the father of information theory. Eventually, he comes back into the story, but uh, Alan Turing uh, was the first person that started asking this question, can machines think? And basically he said, you know, he, uh, you know, proposed some ideas. Um, and uh, so he's considered to be the father of information machines. Uh, you know, information theory is Claude Shannon and information machines is Alan Turing. And he passed away in 1954 uh, in very tragic circumstances. Um, and in 1956, John McCarthy came out and organized this Dartmouth conference in which he worked with Claude Shannon to create this idea called artificial intelligence in which the Alan Turing's vision of can machines think could be done. And some of the ideas that he had uh, worked on was things like natural language processing, you know, kind of trying to mimic the human brain. That's the neural network part. And then, um, you know, uh, creativity and things like, these are the ideas that he ha they had in mind at that point when they started artificial intelligence. Um, and in 1960, he created his language called Lisp, which, you know, if you look at it, you know, usual expressions are like, you, you, you know, standard language like JavaScript, you might write sine of 34, whereas in Lisp, you will write it as parenthesis sine 34. It's a very parenthetical language, very, uh, you know, interesting, and it's been a very fundamental language in the AI world, especially. And that's because Lisp was created to manipulate symbols. You know, for example, you know, instead of saying, you know, I'll, I'll show you, you know, my Zcubes screen here, and you see, you can say, you know, I want to calculate a plus b to the power of five, for example. Symbolic way of calculating is like this. It expands that to the expression. You know, you can say instead of this, you can say, you know, I want it to be to the power of seven. And what is that? And we'll calculate that for you. That is symbolic uh, expression. Whereas, you know, three, if it's doing numerically, we'll just say, okay, what is the value of a? What's the value of b? And you do that expression, right? Three plus five, you know, to the power of five is this. And if it's to the power of 50, it is this value. That's numeric. Whereas symbolic is this. So this is why Lisp was created. They basically could represent all of these mathematical expressions as trees like this, and which helped them to do things like, you know, uh, they can find a pattern and replace it with a different pattern. This is essentially X plus Y whole square, and it is being expanded to the sum of X square plus two XY plus um, Y square. And with this kind of approach, they could do things like symbolic differentiation, integration, and so forth. So Lisp was intended for mathematical proofs, okay, mathematical operations symbolically. Now Prolog was another language that was used to create, um, you know, um, to do from a different approach that is logic based. Essentially, you could create, you know, rules and uh, facts and relationships and things like that. For example, you know, Tom is the father of Sally and stuff, and so eventually you say a sibling is a parent child of this this. And then, so is Sally a sibling of Erika? And the answer comes out as yes. So this is kind of, you know, fact-based or logic-based language. So Lisp and Prolog was the big, big two languages in those days. And in 1966, uh, so Prolog came out in the 1970s. So in 1966, Joseph Wiesenbaum actually wrote something that looks, it's called the ELISA uh, program. It's almost like, you know, uh, chat GPT, you know, this is in the 60s, in 60, 1966, remember, 1960, that's the day, year I was born. So, um, and I, I want to kind of show you how, you know, Eliza used to work. So, um, I'm going to ask Z, and it's going to respond to me, you know, and um, I'm just going to tell it I'm sad. And it's saying, this, okay. Um, I'm going to repeat it just to confuse it. Let's see what happens. See, it, it understands. It's almost talking to me like a therapist. And that's what Eliza used to do. And um, so this is what 
you know, what chat GPT is doing now, but this used to be one of the things that they achieved in 66, but obviously it's behaving like a therapist is much less in terms of uh, capability, but the idea was there. And, you know, AI was, you know, having all these objectives and stuff, but in the seventies, uh, you know, Marvin Minsky and uh, Seymour, pa Seymour Papert, they came out with perceptrons. It's kind of a neural network. But they also realized that you cannot represent XOR in a single, um, you know, in a, in a pure perceptron. And uh, they kind of reported this result and said, you know, AI is not going to work and stuff like that. And so it kind of put a damper on the entire AI thing. And for about 20 years, AI was kind of dead. Um, and then what happened was by the 90s, they had kind of figured out that these are the main categories, uh, expert systems, natural language processing, image processing, computer vision, and these as the big things that they wanted to solve in the uh, AI domain. So these were the classic exp expectations at that time, and then neural networks also. But what has happened over time, you know, strangely is that over this, you know, the last 40 years, uh, since that time, instead of having these different domains that people's were, people were experts in, uh, they say they, all of these were solved by a single idea, that is neural networks. Neural networks basically took over all these other things, and now it does expert systems, it does image processing and stuff. So it's an interesting thing that you know they had split into several domains and suddenly over the years, they all kind of solved each of these problems. And I want to focus on two of these to, for the rest of the story, that if image processing and natural language processing, in, initially it doesn't look like they have anything in common. They're like two different things, right? It's two different domains, but it so happens that this competition or this way that people are trying to solve these two in separate worlds ended up eventually solving AI. You know, and, um, you know, when you look at this thing, right, this AI, you know, I was telling Al, you can also read it as Al, right? How does that happen? And how, why do, how do we, we perceive these letters, you know? And that's what he, Hubel and Wiesel figured out in 1959. And they said that, you know, cat's visual cortex actually works based on a cascading model. That's basically, you take a grid of pixels and then you get a value and then get a grid of that and you get another value. And that's the way in which the brains work and how we discern, you know, basically we, we figure out vision. You know, you can see that, you know, it's got these different angular uh, strokes here and that's fed into different neurons. And there's, this is the basis for convolutional neural network. And um, they got the Nobel prize for this work in 1981. And N. Le Quinn, um, he actually had solved, used this technique to solve how you can read zip codes and envelopes on postal for postal service actually i remember when i came to the us uh, they had uh, um, um, you know they, they would say that you know you write the zip codes correctly so that because it's read by, read by a machine these days not by you know uh, by humans anymore so we used to be very careful writing the zip code to be proper um, and then later uh, they solved in 1995 they solved how to read checks so you know it could be done electronically and without humans having to read and enter it into some computer so, um, and these two were solved by Jan Lequin and, um, and those were, you know, fascinating things at that point. And in 2006, uh, Fei Fei Li of Stanford actually created something called ImageNet. So her idea was let's get, you know, she collected like 14 million images and she actually asked people to go through it and document each of them. And this was in parallel with the natural language processing world, which in the 1980s in Princeton, they had created this thing called WordNet where they were collecting all these, you know, nouns and verbs and stuff like parts of speech and a lot of things of that nature, uh, which was trying to address natural language processing world. And Fei Fei Li did it for the image processing world. She just collected the data and put it out there. And in 2012, Jeffrey Hinton's team in University of Toronto kind of solved this problem of image recognition and stuff with ImageNet, on ImageNet, um, using the CNN approach that came from Jan Lipkin and others. Um, and they use GPUs and a uh, particular activation function called really, which is very simple. So they solved it and they had such be you know, beautiful performance that uh, it's, it's probably widely recognized as the, as the year everything changed. 2012 was the year that everything changed. And there AlexNet won the competition. And um, so um, this Ilya Sutskever, who was in the team is the one who is right now running OpenAI. He's the CTO of OpenAI. And he will come back to the story in a moment. Uh, so image, uh, so for image recognition, CNNs were good because it's it's grid based. Whereas when you apply that to sentences, speech recognition, handwriting recognition stuff, it becomes a problem because it's uh, you know you have to look at different parts of the sentence, right? When you're reading through a sentence, what was before, what is the word before that, and so forth. 
And that's when they created this idea called recurrent neural network. But the unfortunate problem is it's not parallelizable, you know, and uh, uh, because it's recursive. And the biggest issue that they had was when you're trying to do back propagation, the gradients simply go to zero or infinity. And that is a big problem. So they came out with this idea of uh, LSTM, which is long short term memory, in which they keep the original value as another channel that goes parallel to the rest of the process. And uh, gated recurrent units, another idea that they had. So they solved the problem, but recurrence was not solved. And that got solved with this huge thing that happened. And this happened in Google in 2017. Um, they used this idea of self attention um, to solve the problem of natural language processing. Just see that they went from the image processing world to the natural language world, right? So transformers were when initially designed to solve the problem of translation, machine translation from English to French, they used it for. And they uh, came out with the self-attention idea. And this paper is considered to be a, a humongous deal, just like the Bitcoin paper. And this transformers, this is the architecture of it. And I'll focus on a couple of things here. But you know, Google, Google's techni the technology called BERT actually works on the left. This is the encoding side, and that's the decoding side. So BERT actually uses the encoding side. That's why it's bi-directional encoder representations for transformers. This is what they use in Google. Whereas OpenAI, uh, strangely enough, as soon as this paper came out, the next day, Ilya Suskaiver, who was running OpenAI, you know, obviously OpenAI was started with Elon Musk, and he was the one who recruited Ilya into um, the OpenAI. And he says that the day that he saw it, the next day after this was published, he saw the paper and then they changed the architecture of whatever they were doing to focus on the decoder side, the trans they switched to transformers. And the biggest thing with transformers is that it is parallelizable. You know, with, we avoided the recursion problem with the uh, RNNs. And then you had, you know, you could, it's almost like bubble sort. It's like a, you know, brute force kind of thing. It just sends every combination into this, into this uh, stream. And I mean, obviously you need a lot of hardware and stuff like that. Um, but um, they solved the problem. And um, what Ilya's dream was, if you could give all the data into the system, eventually it might do something beautiful. And that's what that really has happened with chat GPT and stuff. It just behaves beautifully. Um, but there are two things I want to show you here. Um, one is that they use this thing called precision and encoding. So th that basically means you get this uh, picture that you see on the, the greenish picture, that's basically showing how a word in can be located in a sentence. So that way they could, you know, when you're feeding this thing into it, the vectors could represent where the word in a sentence was. And that is one important thing they did. And they used, um, you know, obviously, um, it, you know, the words were embedded when they fed into it. And that's a very critical point. And if you put just arbitrary, absolutely random information into a transformer, it's going to give you random information outside out also, right? But why does it even work? Why does this thing even work? And I want to kind of give you the insight on why it starts to work. And the reason is the, the embedding itself. So word embedding basically means you represent every word like king and man and woman and queen and stuff as a vector. And it is so, it's done in such a way that in the vector, if you take the vector of king, you subtract out man and you add woman's vector to it, you will get queen. So there is some real world relationship already built into the, the information that's going into it. So, um, you know, open AI's um, approach was take this and take the decoder part out and just feed information in. And then you give the uh, question that you have and it'll just simply predict the next word. And that's all it's doing, it's just simply predicting the next word. But just because of the amount of information and the patterns that are encoded into this neural network, uh, along with the positional encoding and all this stuff, you know, if you look at it, you know, this NX basically means the number of times this, this loop is made. So um, NX is the number of times this loop goes back and forth and stuff like that. So this, Contraption basically, you know, with figures out all the different probabilities and stuff. It is ready to just predict the next word and just, you know, like even Ilya and all those people, they never expected it to work this beautifully at that point when they made it. So right now we are all fascinated by these generative approaches that are happening, you know, like for example, stable diffusion, they use stable diffusion models, which is essentially like you take, take a picture, you add noise to it, and then you, you know, randomly, you know, reinsert some noise into it and work it backwards and you create a different, uh, we, we basically generate a different image or a movie or whatever. And um, generative adversarial network is another one that's called GAN. And that's what is used by, you know, 
for example, they took AlphaGo to create to uh, create a uh, kind of a solution for uh, playing the Go game, and Alpha Zero was the version of it that started from nothing. It learned the game and actually uh, played against itself. So it's kind of another way of uh, doing these neural networks where you can have uh, you know things learning by itself um, by playing with itself. So we have been fascinated by these generative AI at this point, but I want to kind of differentiate the two big aspects of AI. There is a machine interface to AI as well as a human interface to AI. The thing that I want to kind of point to you, point out to you is that when you're dealing with human interfaces, you are okay with variations and approximations. You want, actually you want misinformation and disinformation because that basically means you're not a slave to the information, right? It's not like somebody tells the truth and you just do something. If, if you, they misinform you, you can act on it. There is some possibility to create obfuscate and stuff. That's what human experience is. And so generative AI tends to be in that mode of approximations and stuff. Whereas when you look at the machine interfaces, they want precise answers like auto driving and stuff like that, right? You can insert approximation, but uh, you know, it, it is at scale, it could get very dangerous if it's going to just you know, have misinformation and that things of that nature. So I tend to call these as synthetic AI and non-synthetic AI, or in other words, synth AI and non-synth AI. Non-synth AI is the human interface, the chat GPT, the approximate kind of versions. Synthetic AI is for the machine learning, the, uh, the one that is used in uh, places like car, auto car driving and things of that nature, which is what I feel would be the big aspects of AI. Now, there's a question that I wanna ask you, why are neural networks so huge? Like, 175 billion parameters or something for GPT-3 and 10 trillion for GPT-4 and stuff like that. Um, it just means that you need humongous amounts of hardware and things like that. And, and the reason is, you know, um, when you look at a program, a program is basically like a big neuron, a complex neuron that takes the input and gives it over, right? That's what a conventional program, you can imagine it like that. But you can also split that complex neuron into, you know, a bunch of other functions. And so this is what I call as, um, you know, um, a, a neural chip, right? You basically have a chip which does a certain function. And so the problem that is happening with the neural networks now is that, you know, you're taking a problem that's a huge amount of all of information and stuff like that. And then at every node, it's a weight plus bias, right? Weight multiplied by an X plus bias. And so it is made into a linear expression at every node. So because of which the problem now gets flattened into a humongous neural network. That's why we need so many parameters and stuff to actually do something. That's the real, uh, I'm trying to give you an insight of why they are so huge. Whereas if you adopted this, you know, this is what we are working on called functional neural networks in which we look at each neural, it's basically like neural circuits like in our brain. Um, so each complex function, the whole program itself is actually uh, when you know instead of trying to derive the neural network out it creates a functional neural network out of it and that's what we call it as omnifunctional ai so a similar idea has been used by mit to solve their auto driving problem and there's something that they've been working on called the liquid time constant neural networks so the thing that i want you to notice is uh, for a conventional neural the um, convolutional neural network it required 5 million parameters it, uh, the uh, the car drives well automatically uh, but it required 5 million parameters. Whereas with this uh, liquid time constant approach, they have reduced it to just 19 neurons that uh, that can handle the whole thing with you know, 75,000, uh, the, the, the normal layers. The idea here is that, you know, we cannot just keep having like, you know, humongous numbers of parameters because it means that you need tons of hardware. So if you want to run it on your, you know, tell your phone or other devices on the IoT or something like that, your internet of things, you need to have things that can run in smaller hardware, right? And that's where this idea of, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the neural chips uh, come in. And uh, LTC is a case in which they applied it to a synth AI. Uh, this is a classic example of synth AI. So uh, things like this is what is going to change the way AI comes into our lives. And we are always not going to be doing this chat GPT business anymore. Uh, in fact, you know, I have an example here uh, where, um, you know, this is how we use chat GPT. You know, we ask a question and we press a button and then immediately it fills it to the text, right? And into this text, you can actually um, add formula, for example, you know? So this is what we call as omnifunctionality. You know, these images are things that the AI built. You know, I asked it like, you know, for example, here, uh, you know, uh, give me a picture of car flying into the moon. It generated it for me. 
And likewise, it, I said, you know, create an example of, you know, a code for finding prime numbers. And it gave me the code with, you know, already filled in. So if I run it, it'll give me the, uh, the prime numbers between such and such numbers, you know, or, uh, you know, I want code to create something else. It'll just give me the code. I just, you know, so this is the way we, we use chat GPT, you know, not going there and asking a question, but actually interacting with the data in our document itself. So, um, you know, at some point I, I see that the server-based AI will disappear in favor of, uh, you know, things like functional neural networks where neural network chips are going to be the, the way to do things. Now, a uh, very significant change is, technology is coming up on the other side. And that's what I want to kind of, you know, kind of uh, when I'm going into the singularity aspect uh, to introduce you to. Um, and that is that of quantum computing. And typically our uh, basic, uh, what do you call, um, computers work on bits, right? Zeros and ones. Whereas qubits is what quantum computing works on. And there are some very interesting things about quantum computing. I'll give you a flavor for what this looks like. I don't expect you to understand everything about it. You know, uh, you need to do your own research on it. And it's a very, you know, quantum computing is always, quantum theory itself is very complex. So, uh, but just be aware that it is, you know, um, this technology can actually solve, you know, for example, the prime number uh, factorization and things like that, which can break our SSL technology that we depend on for encrypting things. Um, so some of the assumptions here is, you know, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, you know, the X, the, they, they are represented as complex numbers in, uh, so A, B, right? It's a, it's a complex number, but they have to, the square of it has to add up to one. So basically you have like a unit sphere, like the unit circle we did for trigonometric calculations, right? You sine square plus, you know, cosine square equal to uh, one, that sort of thing. So uh, this is how it all works. But when you increase the number of qubits, you have a N dimensional Q sphere. Um, and then, you know, you can do this thing. This is a tensor multiplication. So every one of the pairs is uh, added up here. So one multiply by three, one multiply by four, two multiply by three, two multiply by four and stuff like that. And um, with this, they can do the computation. But the thing is, you know, when you read the values, it, it collapses and it disappears. So the tactic that they use, and they want to do it in a reversible way. And you, you know, when you go into the depths of it, you'll understand all these. But the way they handle that is by keeping the input also along with the output, okay? And it's very similar to the LSTM world in the neural networks world where they kept the, uh, the initial values as memory, you know, to, to go ahead with. So, uh, with this, they, they actually will be able to solve some extremely complicated problems. And uh, there is an actual uh, demo on the, uh, on the web. And this is IBM's uh, you know, um, um, test bench or whatever, in which you can actually go and operate on the, on the quantum computer. And the kind of code is written here. Um, and uh, this one particular one that we took snapshots of, it basically shows you that the quantum entanglement problem and you can see these two values are uh, similar values. Basically, that's showing that it is entangled. Um, so it's a live thing. It's 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 happening, and it's on the web. You can mess with it yourself. You can go to the IBM website, and you know the, the link is right there. Uh, you can test it out yourself. So it is working. Um, so um, we expect, and there are uh, you know when you go into the algorithm side of computer science, you'll understand things like NP complete problems and uh, you know P versus NP, and there's a big amount of theory and questions regarding all of these. The equivalent in the quantum world is called BQP, the bounded error quantum polynomial time. It's equivalent to the P problems, the, the polynomial problems. Um, so, BX, and you can see it's much better, it's much bigger than the P in the, uh, the normal P problems, the uh, polynomial problems. So, it's going to have impact in the NP complete world and stuff like that. Maybe it will overlap. You know, the quantum computing might take over some of these and solve all of these problems at once. We don't know how it's going to go, but this is the uh, the fascinating thing and uh, that's happening. It's technology that is out there. And I expect, you know, in my way of thinking, I believe the impact of quantum computing is going to be a lot more than AI. Because right now we are fascinated with generative AI, which is going to die off after some time, maybe it'll last for a few years. But synthetic AI is going to be the big thing. But quantum computing is what is going to change, you know, give us a, another, you know, a very different way to deal with things. Just like convolutional neural networks did to the, the past approaches. Uh, the symbolic and the uh, the logic based approaches we had before that. So the timeline that we expect is the artificial general intelligence to be achieved by another five years or so, and followed by a decade of quantum computing. So by 2045, you know, Ray Kurzweil says that 
uh, we'll probably have uh, you know artificial super intelligence which is essentially like for $1,000, you can get a computer that is smarter than all of the humanity combined or something of that, that level of sophistication. So that's what the future looks like. And you're all, this is what your career is going to take you through um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and eventually singularity. We don't know what's going to happen after that. It's going to be something very fascinating, but uh, um, I hope uh, you got some insights into this whole, whole world and you can check us out at zcubes.com. Uh, to learn more of Domini Function AI. Um, and uh, if anybody is looking for internships and stuff, you know, come along and join us. Um, so uh, at this time, I would like to open it up for questions. Um, and uh, um, so any questions at hey, this Joe, point? <clears throat> Joe, can you stop? Yeah, very perfect. Uh, yeah. Whenever you put their cameras back on, that'd be great. Okay. Um, and we'd love to have questions and dialogue around this. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a thousand questions. So I imagine my yes. students have some questions as well. So, uh, so you could, if you're more comfortable putting your question in the chat first, and then you could, uh, you could uh, just kind of uh, raise your hand and talk it out or just shout it out. Um, either one is fine. Let's get a discussion going. Though. Question. I guess I'll start it out. So yes. you spoke about quantum computing and prime factorization, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your opinion on, say, harvest now and decrypt later? A lot of people have started like harvesting uh, the data in transit in hope to like decrypt it later. Yes. Isn't it like a huge threat to say uh, confidential information or government That's information? Yes, it is. It yeah. is. Um, you know, the, the thing with whenever you're dealing with information is you know, information is evolving, right? See the yeah. moment that when you go into the prehistory, like the ancient ancient history, the moment one type of animal got a, a teeth, right? <laughs> it could bite something. It could, you know, take over the, the other ones that didn't have teeth, right? It started eating yeah. the rest, just like that. And, you know, it just comes because of competition of ideas. And, you know, for some time we looked like, you know, prime factorization cannot happen. So SSL made sense. And even Bitcoin depends a lot on HTTP, yeah. all that yeah. uh, keys and all that stuff, right? And we're all, you know, keeping it all encrypted. But at some point, it all comes out. Now, I want to give you another example of it. You know, all the pictures that people took, you know, in throughout history, right? I mean, like uh, 10 decades and decades, we have been taking pictures and stuff. We almost assumed like, you know, I have a picture that is kept here and nobody ever will know about that, right? Nobody will be able to find me in a group photo in something. But yeah. that's not the case anymore. Right, you, know, yeah. you just do one search, and you know all the. I mean, I I was doing something, and I found, you know, it could actually detect my sister's picture when she was one year old, you know, like long back, you know, from her baby picture, and come in comparison with, with the current picture, which is very unusual, right? We don't we expect our face to change and stuff like that, but signatures remain. So likewise, um, and we'll have to just give up the expectation of privacy, come out with some other idea, maybe legal way of protecting things or something like that. You know, if everybody knew everything about everyone, so uh, you know what what is next, right? We're going to look at some other base of trying to to control that, maybe legally or something like that. But yeah, you're right. It's 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 all going to be exposed and quantum. And we are dealing with intelligence. We are dealing with intelligence at a scale we have never seen. You know, yeah. we cannot even imagine it. And I was really surprised when it found out a one year old's baby's picture to be very similar to her. You know, maybe thirty year old or something. I didn't even think it was going to happen, but it is. And this was in a group photo with hundreds of people. <laughs> Can you believe that? So, uh, yeah, don't expect privacy. And, but the flip side of it is with more computing, there may be other ideas that might come yeah. up. Yeah. You know, so just evolve cool. and find new ways of encrypting. Things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And but maybe if encrypting is not the way to protect certain things. You know, that may be how it is. Because if everybody has, see, information is a very, very interesting thing because. And that's why I spent some time initially talking about intelligent information and stuff like that. Because information, once it is exposed, it's exposed forever, right? So we tend yeah. to not expose it until it is exposed. And if it's put on the internet or something, then everybody knows it, right? Then you cannot take it yeah. back, you cannot erase it anymore. So, um, but you know, quantum computing and stuff might actually solve that problem with a different technique to go forward and do things. So that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do. And with singularity and stuff, we don't even know. I mean, it may not even care all the things that we are trying to protect anyways, because you know? it's so intelligent. It'll give you some 
you just don't do all these nonsense you know like you do this and your crispr is done or something like that crispr is the biotech world yeah yeah going on <laughs> they'll just tell you oh, you fix this disease by just doing it don't worry about medical privacy <laughs> i know how to fix this problem or something <laughs> you can do that so, yep other questions i'm sure everyone will have a question yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Yes, yeah, Sriram, you want to ask that out loud or are you good with the chat? Either one. Oh, I can just ask that. Yeah, I was wondering, I'm curious uh, what work your company does and everybody Yeah, so, uh, you know, our idea initially was uh, we found a problem with software itself, you know, in that we realized that all the software that is being built are actually supposed to solve a single problem, like Excel to compute or Word to compose or PowerPoint to present or browser to browse and so forth. And, you know, um, and that's what we call as omnifunctional world, sorry, monofunctional world. Each software does one thing. And we had this dream of creating a software that can do everything at the same time. Like when I was showing you the, the content space in which I could just compute, you know, imagine Excel and Word and PowerPoint, everything merging into one with a programming uh, thing sitting on top of it. See, I, we were doing symbolic um, calculations as well as numeric calculations and Z-cubes at the same time. So we put all these ideas into one and just like Ilya Suskaiva realized that, you know, uh, transformers actually work for if you put more and more scale to it, similar to that, um, we realized omnifunctionality is possible to achieve. And then we, you know, we were trying to hack AI for a long time. I would say for the last one decade, we have been trying to, you know, build Prolog into our system, Lisp into our system and ideas of that sort. Um, there's a lot of theory behind all that, but um, but it all combined together. And you know, luckily for us, AI was solved in a more grander scale by OpenAI, so we could just simply integrate that, which which is much simpler for us to do also. Uh, and we wouldn't have been able to solve certain things without humongous amounts of GPU and things like that. So uh, we have been after this for a long period of time, and uh, so we have achieved this thing called omnifunctionality, where all functions can be within the same space and. And now, you know, Zcubes works in all kinds of platforms. It can even work on an IoT device, Linux, Mac, Windows, and so forth. And even in different forms, you know, there is a command line driven part of it. There's a web-based part of it, desktop version of it. It can behave as web server. So we, and it has a language running behind all of these, which actually translates to JavaScript. So basically it, um, it, it's a very interesting combination of things, which with which we, we expect to take over a lot of the spaces that currently is occupied by Microsoft and Google and Adobe and stuff in separate, separate ways. Um, so we have we have solved the problem of documents, media, and logic in an omnifunctional space. So there are 3D spaces, and I didn't show you any of that kind of stuff because of the lack of time. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can ask for a demo and we'll we'll go through a more detailed demo of it. Um, so um, you know, to create editable documents and editable images and stuff. So an image that you build in our app, you can edit it and you can add, you can put video into pictures and all kinds of stuff because that's omnifunctionality. So we are expecting, we have integrated artificial intelligence into it and it has its own neural networks and stuff like that inside of it. And it's infinitely extensible too, by the way, because in the desktop and the um, uh, command line driven world, it actually has node inside of it. So it does a lot of other things too. You can, you can put uh, NPMJS libraries into it and stuff. So. We expect it to be a replacement for a lot of segmented applications, languages, and stuff. You know, right now we use Python to do certain things, and uh, you know, browser to do something else, and Power BI to do something else, and stuff. So, Zcubes does all of that at once, and that's what omnifunctionality is. So, we are after this, you know, eventual dream of omnifunctional AI, in which we have, I believe, achieved a lot of that already. And functional neural networks is the next thing we are going after, which I think is going to be a, a huge, um, huge thing. If you can solve it, that's going to be like simple super intelligence on your machine is what they eventually we expect that to be. We have Jack and Leo. Jack, you want to go first? Yeah, I was. Uh, my question is with the becoming developments in AI, do you think we're going to start to get a more definitive understanding of consciousness or at least intelligence? Um, like I said in one of the slides and, and the, the Mexican dinner story, you know, we were having and we were conversing about all of these kind of, you know, questions like, you know, this uh, metaphysical stuff. Um, and, you know, 
I've always asked this question. Why did in the Bible, for example, it says word was God. I never really understood it. What is, what is, it doesn't make any sense to me. And then I saw the same thing in many of the other religious texts. And I'm not a religious person to that extent. Like, but um, like, I don't just buy it as it, whatever they writ uh, they've written, but I've always wondered why did they say word was God, which never made sense to me. And then I started thinking, what if it is information? What is information? But how can information be an intelligence? And I was thinking about it. And we know, like, for example, they say God is created by itself, right? Self-created. And that's when I connected information to itself and see if information could animate itself, which is evolution, right? Basically, you know, something changes and suddenly it makes sense. And then that's what intelligence is. And that started to make sense. And then I was just doing this mental thing, like what if intelligence could animate itself? And that could be what consciousness is. So that's the way I am reconciling it to myself. I, you know, that's the way it makes a lot of sense to me, but obviously there may be other ideas, but if you look at chat GPT, it is a pure animation of things, right? Just information going in and just suddenly starts to look intelligent to us. Obviously it's not like super intelligent. It's, it makes its own hallucinations and stuff like that. So is it what we feel is intelligent? Right? It's just giving an answer. It is looks very intelligent to us, so we buy into it. So there is some relationship. It's all part of evolution. It may be the way our brains work. We are our brains are designed as a neural network of some sort that you know, assumes that is the correct thing, or maybe it just works and that's what reality is. I mean, I mean, when you're looking at that level, it almost becomes like when you're dealing with matter at the level of you know subatomic particles, it goes into this quantum states, right? where it is not like rigid. It's not like, you know, um, it's like a wave and all this. You, know, you don't even quite understand how it works. Um, so when you go into the depths of it, the reconciliation I have had is that of this animation of itself, which made a lot of sense to me. And you just let information evolve, it will become intelligent. And um, so if you say God was information, the first bit, why did it happen? So it gives me some closure in it. Um, there may be other answers to it, but let, let information evolve. Let intelligence evolve. Let's see what where it's going to take us. That, you know, if you look at uh, biotech itself, like in the biological world, um, the, the kind of things that genes do, it started as a little, you know, what was the first life like? We don't even know. It's like a bacteria of some sort doing some kind of chemical exchange and stuff like that. Now it is a human and humans are doing this and we might add computers to ourselves and become some kind of hybrid robot or whatever. And then what will, you know, a hundred thousand or a million years later, what will even, hum I mean, humans may not exist. We might be some other kind of thing, um, but it could be super intelligent of some sort, right? Uh, and we, it's a world of a fantasy, right? You, you watch, we watch all the Star Wars and all this Jedi, this power and that power and things like that. So, uh, but it's all information evolving. But uh, to recognize information, it, sorry, intelligence and consciousness as, a derivative derivative of information gives you a lot of interesting um, what do you call um, interesting ways to think about it, you know. And even thinking is information, right? We we you know uh, we mess within our, our brain and we come out with the new information and we tell somebody and they act on it. They may not act on it. They might actually act on it. And that's how the world works. So um, yeah, that. Um, at some point, that super intelligence might solve that problem. <laughs> Thank you. That was some great insights. Thank you. I'm sorry? Those are, those are some great insights. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, Leo, great question, Jack. Leo? Uh, yeah, kind of going off of that, like how much of a requirement do you think it is to know information theory to work on and develop AI? Like, is it necessary to know or is it helpful to know or do you just not really need to know it to get stuff done? Uh, information theory that Claude Shannon came out with, it is, you know, I mean, uh, the reason I was talking about those things is to kind of show you where was that big jump that happened in human thinking, right? To think about, for example, all the machines before in the old, the previous centuries, right? Uh, the 18th century and all, like, you know, water pump and all that stuff. They did not have any logic to it. They had, they could do just one thing. And then Charles Babbage came out with this idea of, you know, programmable machines and stuff. So eventually, okay, we could change the program of the machine. And that was the first step. And then in all the telecommunication circuits and things like that. And to map the fact that this circuit is something that can represent a logical expression. 
that's a big insight. That's what Claude Shannon did. And, you know, and he came out with this theory about how much noise versus how much actual information, what is the minimum amount of noise that we can handle and things of that nature. So that's what the information theory is about. Um, but in terms of understanding how bits work, how you can take a pro problem, you know, we don't look at how a transistor is wired underneath or something like billions of transistors working underneath a, in a chip or something like that. Uh, we just use it. We, you know, most of us don't even know how exactly it works. It just works. Um, so that insight is good for us, you know, and likewise, how the qubits are going to work when the quantum computing, that's interesting to know about it. But that doesn't, you know, prevent us from writing an AI program or, uh, you know, software or things like that. Information theory is, you know, it's, it's pretty much like, um, it's a fundamental theory of something. We are building on top of it in layers with more and more sophistication, more and more, you know, better ways of doing things. Um, see, right now, we don't even care what a PowerPoint data format is, it looks like inside, right? We just look at, okay, start the presentation, it should just show the things and that's it. We don't look at how it works underneath. But the reason why you want to know about those things is that that insight helps you to solve bigger problems at some other point. And you might think about a different way of doing quantum computing, or maybe, you know, um, you know, some of the other theories you might have to come out with may have some relationship to how Claude Shannon thought about mapping a circuit to a, you know, something else. So uh, it's not necessary to do great things in life, but that insight, all of these insights actually help, you know, with solving a bigger or a different problem at some point. Maybe you will be 10 years later down the road, you might be working with CRISPR and manipulating the genetics of something or something like that. And you might use that, that uh, insight from the, uh, uh, you know, from the information theory into the genetic world. You know, remember that, you know, Ilya Suskyver, he applied what he learned from the image processing world, right, the convolution neural network, and applied it to the natural language translation world, or sorry, the natural language processing world to solve the uh, chat GPT problem. So you can see they took something from images and applied it to text. So that's the kind of thing we have to, uh, so if he did not know about CNNs and image processing, he could not have solved this, uh, you know, open AI problem. You know, so, I mean, they could not have even started OpenAI. In fact, uh, Elon was working with Ilya because he's also working on, they were interested in Tesla cars and, you know, all the um, image detection and stuff for self-car driving, uh, which is a, you know, world apart from natural language processing, right? Chat GPT has nothing really to do with Tesla's, uh, uh, you know, um, image processing and stuff. So the more things you know, it always helps. So. Not that you need to know to be an expert or get a PhD in that sort of thing, um, but to uh, information is the key. It's, it is what that drives everything. So the more you know about such things, like how much of noise is acceptable, right? That's something very important to know when you're dealing with, let's say CRISPR or something, how much of noise is acceptable and that theory might help you. So, um, so always try to get insight into as many different domains as you can. That helps you with it um, you know, in unexpected ways. All right, thank you. Yep. Great question, Leo. Yeah, uh, Joe, in your in your presentation, <clears throat> you used the technique a couple times of sort of zooming in and out from one slide back down. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, this I believe it resonated with me too. With AI specifically, you have to really develop, and computer science overall, you have to really develop that ability to have that general knowledge of a lot of different spaces zoom out see how it all interconnects then zoom back into whatever project you want to work on and i love that technique that you use and i love that answer that you just gave too um matt you want to go next and we'll go gee and will yeah i kind of have a question on a completely different vein of uh, i've worked in a couple of law offices and a couple of businesses that are like not very tech savvy mm -hmm. and you I think over like the next decade or two, there's going to be a huge clash between companies that are like utilizing this resource or these resources and companies that are like failing to adapt at all. And do you think that it's going to kind of just be necessary to adapt or do you think that, that, that the companies that refuse to adapt will still find a path? You know, the, the strange thing about AI is that it's not the cleverness of the programmer that makes AI. It's the amount of data that makes AI. Right? I was showing the old paradigm with the new paradigm, which basically means data is what is driving everything, not an individual company's or a person's smartness. It's what data do they have. 
And if they don't have the data, it's ignorance and they, they have to somehow solve it. Um, but a totally intelligent system should be able to deal with totally dumb people, right? That is the <laughs> definition of it. Otherwise, how can you be smart? <laughs> if you cannot be yeah. a little kid about, you know, some concept, you know, what kind of a teacher are you kind of thing, right? I mean, you, you should be able to go. And that's what I believe super, artificial super intelligence or artificial general intelligence is expected to be. You know, we don't care about how our car, the engine and the thermodynamics of it anymore. You just start the car and go, right? With an electric car, you don't even start it. You get in and you go, right? So it is getting uh, to a level where all of these are happening. You know, and, and, and I was driving a Tesla and the experience is so much different from all the other cars I've had before. And the kind of thing that I realize is what are the things I don't have to think about? Like it drives by itself. So I don't have to think about tons of things. And I can even be looking at a phone. It is fine because the car is driving by itself, right? So, but if you were in a normal car, you would not dare to look at your phone when you're driving, right? That sort of thing. So um, the more artificial intelligence changes, what we think of as lesser, you know, what do you call, um, uh, not sophistic sophisticated individuals, that definition might change. Because, you know, the other day I was talking to a sprinkler person, you know, the guy who was fixing a sprinkler. The kind of wisdom he had regarding you know, different kinds of mulch you have to put in all this. I didn't even know these things, you know. Uh, I was surprised at how much they knew about a different domain. So I think we have to look at different people as being expert in different domains and, you know, not them not knowing something like, you know, let's say how a quantum computer works or something is fine because we all are working from our point of ignorance or our point of knowledge. And AGI and stuff like that are supposed to take care of that sort of uh, differences we have. You know, like, for example, if all of the information is stored in English language and you only speak like Chinese or something, you know, um, until now, now there is machine translation. I can just go pull up a Chinese paper and translate and read it in English and at least understand what's going on. Previously, they didn't have that, that technique, right? So it, the whole thing of AGI, the general intelligence is that all of these kind of things are going to come together where individual differences or even our lack of initiative, whatever, that will be irrelevant. The AGI is supposed to work with that. Um, you know, we make a lot of noise about misinformation and disinformation, things like that. People talk about all that stuff. You now you can also look at it as I call misinformation as whatever is missing information and disinformation is with the, the descending information. <laughs> whoever is disagreeing with us, we, that's disinformation. So even we are playing with that game, right? Where you know we think, oh, he doesn't know, I know it better, or whatever. But mm -hmm. the real world has to still work. So uh, the solution of AI at some point would be to get rid of such differences and they have become so irrelevant. Like, let's say that you can run at uh, five miles per hour and I can run at four miles per hour and AI can run at hundred miles per hour. Who cares? Our difference of four and five, <laughs> this thing is so much better than us. So that's the kind of approach we have to take. But from our own perspective, get into as many domains as possible, understand what they are, because at some point you might connect two or three of them and you may, you'll make something very interesting out of it. So. Awesome. Really interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, Guy? I really like your answer to the last question. Uh, like, we're working from our point of ignorance. Yep, yep. Um, but uh, my question is, I was wondering if you would know of any resources just to get ahead in quantum computing. Um, I tried to do, like, the, the IBM Qiskit summer school uh, mm -hmm. every summer. Uh, but I was just wondering if you have any other resources just for being ahead in quantum, because it's not necessarily like offered uh, um, as college level coursework, uh, because yeah. it's such a at an early stage. Yeah, and uh, I think the, uh, the Microsoft's uh, this one. I'll, I'll give you these some of these links, which are very interesting. There's a Microsoft presentation where they talked about some of these details, and uh, see, I. I don't like when they just present you these are the core facts of thing and you know, just use it and that's the kind of stuff that you have to get insights into it. Then only you remember what it is, right? You have to understand what is happening here. They'll say, you know, a superposition of this and that and, you know, collapsing and stuff. So I'll give you a few links on that. And there was a particular person called, I believe, Moreno, Dr. Moreno or something, Andrea Moreno or something. Awesome. Uh, he goes into the difference between the antimony atoms and this and that and why they use a particular type of atom and things like that for doping, whatever transistor, and why you need to have the classical computer over a quantum computer to make it work. You cannot just have a quantum computer by itself. So you're saying, don't kill the classic computing. You still need it. Uh, so, you know, insights of that, that sort is what is going to be a lot more helpful. 
So I'll give you some of the links on that. And you know, there are some very basic ones by PBS and things which I, you know, which are you know, obviously to get an idea of it, but to know what is really happening itself. How are people thinking about these things, right? Now, how are they expecting it to happen? And people like Moreno or Dr. Moreno are just awesome in terms of, uh, you know, they look at it from a you know insightful point of view. That's the sort of thing I, I you know, any of these coursework we take. I don't really buy into it too much. It just gets, uh, you know, it's like just the core facts. And, but you need insights into that. That's, that's the way to look at it. And uh, regarding the point about the uh, ignorance that you're talking about, I have a joke on that. Basically that, you know, in my way of thinking, um, in the corporate world or any, any part of it, politics or whatever, people rise to their level of incompetence. <laughs> they cannot rise above that. You know? So everybody is at their level of incompetence incompetence you know beyond that they cannot go because they're not competent enough so you know working on your competence you know it's okay to admit that you're incompetent or ignorant or something because then you will fill that gap and proceed it's to pretend that we are not incompetent not ignorant in area is the problem so uh, it's you know I, I always find it to be more interesting to say that I don't know something or I I don't know how tell me like I was asking the sprinkler guy or even the grass cutting guy he teaches me things about different funguses of grass and all that stuff. So um, you always have to be humble about it and assume that we are ignorant about things. Yeah, thank you. E ego gets in the way of a lot of things. Yes. It, it inhibits uh, growth and evolution for sure. Um, Will, you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, one, do you think that it's necessary for us to create a general um, artificial intelligence? That we use quantum computers and do you know of any like company that has been working heavily on machine learning and quantum coding um i don't think quantum computing is a necessity for agi to work um because quantum company at, le at least the way we know about it at this point in time it is supposed to solve certain kind of extremely complicated problems much faster it's like two to the power of X factor versus X to the power of two factor, that sort of thing. It's like humongously much faster. Um, it's going to get you things faster. And, uh, you know, but I, I believe in the functional neural network a lot more in terms of reducing the size of computation required. Right now, neural networks, the real serious ones require a ton of computation, right? You know, people are fighting for A100 chip, whatever, H100 chips, like they're fighting, like Elon is fighting for it. And, People are not even finding it in the market, and you know there are there are even like smugglers and stuff dealing with this sort of thing. So um, that's because the uh, uh, you know I, in my opinion it's because we haven't fully solved the FNN problem, the functional neural network problem. So hardware will solve much of that sort of thing um, to reduce it, into, so you can put it into smaller devices and things of that nature. Um, at this moment. Uh, quantum quantum computing is supposed to be able to solve all of the problems that classic computers do, as far as I know. You know, it's supposed to be able to do all of that. It'll be able to do it much faster, at least as fast as the classic computer. Uh, quantum computing requires a lot of. It's very sensitive to even temperatures. We have to go to like zero, almost zero Kelvin, and things like that. It's very. Uh, so we expect it to be at least in the short term, to to be, not even available for anything that serious. You know, you're only like looking at it, you know, I don't know, 64 bits or something so far that different teams have been able to do in uh, quantum computing. But, you know, who knows? I mean, algorithms, there may be a very smart algorithm, just like the Bitcoin paper did or transformer did. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at it, you know, many sort algorithms, right? Your bubble sort and heap sort and what, you know, what's it, quick sort and things like that. Um, Chat GPT, you know, sorry, the transformer is actually at the level of bubble sort. It's the simplest sort you can do. There could be very smart algorithms that that will come up, you know, and um, you know hardware can get even better. And there's going to be a lot of other ways of computing that we don't what even like DNA computing, all kinds of stuff, uh, you know. Um, and quantum computing is going to be the way to compute. But what is it? What is that? It that you're computing? That is the question. That's where the a AGA comes in. And you can always put it in a very large, expensive machine now or a series of machines. I expect it to be a series of servers of sort, sorts um, or a series of networks, neural networks that, you know, I, I tend to, that's why I was trying to give you the picture of a program is a complex neuron, right? And you can split into smaller and smaller neuronal chips, that sort of idea. So um, I expect that to be the one that solves the AGI problem uh, that 
com configuration of it, the, the organization of different neural chips to solve that. Uh, quantum computing will just make it much faster and stuff. And we don't know what's going to happen in the next decade. I Even I don't, not too many people are talking about what's going to happen in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s of this century. They haven't even been able to imagine that. Uh, you know, like CRISPR came out of the blue, right? Whoever thought that you could actually go and change a DNA sequence inside of any creature on the planet, you know, whoever could have thought that. And they're able to precisely do that now. And why? Because they were working with immune systems of uh, you know, bacteria. And that's how they figured all this out, right? No, bacteria has figured out. So if you look into nature, maybe you will get some very interesting solutions from any of these things. Um, like immune system is a great tactic, right? With that, you know, somebody, um, uh, I remember uh, Srini or somebody was asking me, uh, Sri was asking me about um, the, uh, uh, you know, the encryption problem, right? Maybe we will come out with some idea regarding immunity that we can use in uh, the way we, protect things, things like that, you know, we don't know. So um, yeah, that that's the way I think about it. It may not be quantum computing, but um, but it'll, it'll aid further development, like in the 2050s and 60s and 70s of the century. Um, Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I think we have one more uh, from Dane. Matt, do you have another question or just your hand up? Sorry, I still had it up from last time. Okay, no worries. All right, so we'll go with Dane, and then if we have any more questions, we can definitely get a couple more in. But if not, we'll uh, uh, Joe will let you do some closing thoughts after after Dane, if you choose. So, yeah, Dane. Okay, so I mean, we sort of tackled my question in the last one, but I was just going to ask: Do you think that AI is being limited by like the binary nature of computing right now, like? If quantum computing comes out, would AI be more human-like? Because it's more, I don't um, know. Yeah. It, it, I don't know the real, see, I, I was initially I was talking about the digital nature of the universe, right? So many things that we think are continuous are actually digital. It so appears to be continuous to us, you know? So, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to answer that question in that sense, but we have to let, you know, the, uh, like quantum computing can solve all the problems that the classic bit-based computers do. Uh, that's how it is, but what can quantum computing eventually solve? We don't, I don't even know if there are questions that it requires to be answered like that, but, um, but I, to me, I think AI is going to be more constrained with unnecessary, uh, artificial constraints we are putting on AI. We are you know, too concerned about it or too, you know, uh, not concerned about it or whatever. It's just, we tend to put our human ways of thinking into the way it answers things. And that's, to me, that's more of a risk in terms of limiting the current AI. Um, but it's information. How, we call AI is something that may be open AI or, you know, now all the big players have it, like Google has their AI, Adobe is going to have their AI. Uh, you know, every big player, every big state is going to have it. Like China is going to have, India is going to have, you know, all the big players, Europe, uh, France, everyone will have their own versions of AI. Um, and and that's how it's it's going to be. Uh, and everybody will try to put their own controls on, right? They don't want certain things. In China, they're going to control so that it doesn't do certain things. And US is going to do it in a different way. Um, but intelligence, the information always evolves. So we just have to let it happen. Um, I'm not too concerned about you know, artificial intelligence itself, but I am concerned about artificial incompetence. <laughs> that is a bigger danger. Uh, and artificial illusions, they're all called AI. But to me, I think, see, the problem with incompetence is that in artificial intelligence, one thing about that is it's very scalable, right? It, it, now it can suddenly answer everybody's question in the on the planet. It can scale up very well. So if it is incompetent in any one place, it can do a lot of damage. And that's the, you know, if you really look at political aspects, like why does something like communism not work in the long run? Initially, it looks very nice, but it applies one idea to everything. And it works the first time, second time, third time, fourth time something happens, some mistake is made and it is scaled up and then everybody dies or something happens like that. So anytime you look at these larger ideas, what we have to be really careful about not building an incompetence into it. You know, things, and, one more thing is that intelligence is always evolving, information is always evolving, and it is a combination of two or three things that make very incompetent errors. 
right? Like, uh, for example, there was a air crash where the pilot was focused on switching on a particular switch and he was not looking where the plane was going, you know, the kind of thing, you know? They're you know, trying to focus on something that is absolutely irrelevant. I think they were trying to fix some audio system or something. <laughs> the plane went and crashed. So, um, you know, and that's the incompetence part. That's what I would be more worrying about. You know, like, you know, CRISPR, for example, if you allow CRISPR to be applied to everybody indiscriminately and everybody will try to, you know, add additional things to their body and whatever, and then it causes cancer down the street. Like, you know, for example, vaccine uh, that we gave to everyone, right? Um, and one of the things I objected to the vaccine mandate, like they were injecting it into every army person and, <laughs> that we had. My concern was that if there is something wrong with the vaccine that we'll figure out after four years or something, like everybody gets cancer or some nonsense like that, then it affects the entire army. And that's why we need different ideas, right? Different, uh, instead of mandating things to be applied to everybody uniformly, unless you're very, very certain about it, uh, instead, you should be applying it into with different approaches to things. So that's the good part of evolution. Everyone has a different idea or different groups have different ideas. Like every country has their own way of looking at AI. Then the overall AI might come out to be something interesting. But the thing that we have to really watch out for is artificial incompetence at scale. That is what I am most worried about. Not about intelligence itself. Because intelligence is everything. But incompetence is something can be, it can have bad impacts. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Any final questions? Thoughts? Uh, Joe, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, you, you have a young generation who is going to be going through all of these humongous changes in the next two, three decades. And, um, and there's a lot of fear about, you know, what to be going to do when AI takes over jobs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't know the answer to everything. We can't feel, even if somebody tells you everything is going to be okay or everything is going to be bad, both people are going to be pretty much wrong. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going to be. Uh, but you know, humanity has evolved you know, from the days when we didn't even have cell phones. You know, a thousand years back, nobody had cell phones and nobody had current you know, electricity and all that stuff. Um, and I, I want to kind of um, go to one particular person in history that I have always respected, and that's Louis Pasteur. You know, in I actually went to his crypt in uh, in France, and uh, underneath the Pasteur Institute, there is a basement. That's where he's uh, it's been, uh, you know, his re final resting place is. Um, it is fascinating what he did with all of the things he invented and developed and stuff. Right at that time, the way that people thought about how you got a disease was based on four humors: the blood phlegm and all that kind of stuff, you know, the, um, when you go to the depth, depths of it, you understand. They were thinking it is the humors that cause disease. He invented the germ theory of disease. And he then solved rabies vaccine. Rabies is 100% fatal. He developed a vaccine for it when rabies is caused by a virus, not a germ, <laughs> right? How do you do that? And then I'm in his uh, museum, in his lab, he has done experiments that is still working. Even after 100 years, it's still working now, okay? The, whatever that he came out with. He developed it when they had no computers, no electricity, no telephone, all the stuff. How did they do it? So, uh, you know, in a way, we have to get inspiration from how our you know, ancestors have done uh, and apply, you know, don't worry about all the, you know, AI and all that kind of stuff, but always appreciate history. And I, I like the fact that you're a history, you came from the history side. It's an awesome thing to do. Um, and I, you know, the list thing that I was talking about on artificial intelligence languages, um, it took me almost 15 years to figure out why they created this. Nobody knew the answer to that. I asked so many people that question until I found out a paper by John McCarthy written about that summer in 1960 or something. That's when I realized that's what they were trying to do. Now it all made sense. And how does that relate to new languages? Like how Brandon, Brandon E. took the Lisp-like scheme language and made JavaScript out of it. JavaScript doesn't look anything like Lisp, but you know, Mark Andreessen told Brandon E. to put the parentheses inside and not outside. <laughs> Otherwise, we will have a scheme, like a Lisp-like language to do our web scripting. So it always helps to do 
a little bit of research on the history, why somebody did something. That will give you insights. And that's how you should, I think, uh, proceed with everything in life, not just uh, computer science, but every every domain that you get into. Uh, like, you know, uh, why did Venice become the center of glass making? You know, just try to find an answer to that question. And this happened to me when I was a you know degree student, like pre-degree student, actually. One of the professors, and he's a very interesting guy, he said, you know, always ask the question, why? And he said, why is this hibiscus flower red? Find out the answer to that. I found out the answer to that decades later, but um, we should always be asking these questions. Look into history. Why did somebody do something? Not what they did. Don't worry about, you know, if Hitler killed people or not. That is not the point. Why did that happen? What were the things that didn't stop it from happening? You know, um, then you get a lot of insights. You know, there's actually a book called The Making of the Atomic Bomb. If uh, somebody is interested in, in going through history, it's an awesome uh, book. It's a very fat book. It's got, I think, Pulitzer or something. Uh, you know, like always be interested in history because it always helps uh, connecting the dots later on and get into as many domains as possible. Don't try to become a quantum computing expert or something. Be a quantum computing, classical computer, all those things expert. Uh, that's the way to deal with it. Let things evolve in your mind and in the kind of relationships you have with other intellectuals and stuff. So always keep open for evolution. And I always say that there are three things by which you can explain everything. One is randomness, and second is evolution, and the third is fractals. And if you don't know what fractals are, look it up. That's a very significant thing. But with this thing, these three things, you can get a very good understanding of how things evolve you know, the importance of randomness um, and uh, uh, fractals is a very interesting idea, but, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, that's how everything works. So uh, just be realistic about everything and leave things open for evolution to happen. Thank you so much, Joe. So insightful. So this is recorded um, as well, so we can go back and listen to it again. Joe, I'll send it to you as well. Thank you so much yep. uh, for your time. I'll see everyone on Thursday. Um, Joe, if you want to add some of those resources, if students have questions, I can forward them and connect them to you yep. uh, as well. Uh, just let me know and I'll post that as an answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Very nice talk.